kamay ng mga bagong bayani Sa harap ng pagsuko, huwag kang susuko Bigyan ang boses ang sigaw ng masa Ang bagong pag-asa ay mula siyo Mula siyo, mula siyo Panibagong pag-asa ay mula siyo Good day everyone. I'm Marielle Antoinette Zosa uh, from the Department of Philosophy, College of Social Sciences and Philosophy. And today I'll be discussing with you uh, the topic on human rights and human dignity. So before we go uh, to the outline of what we will be talking about, I'd like to present to you a dilemma that has in a way confused me uh, since 2016. I think you've heard of uh, this uh, through the past State of the Nations address, States of the Nation addresses. Uh, here is one taken from 2016 by uh, the President of the Korean Administration, wherein he said that human rights must work to uplift human dignity. So on the topic of human rights and human dignity, you can see that in a sense, uh, the President does agree with uh, a, a relationship between the two concepts. But, however, he says, human rights cannot be used as a shield or an excuse to destroy the country, your country, and my country. So, on the one hand, uh, this, the current administration is saying that human rights and human dignity, uh, the two notions, have a certain connection with each other. But on the other hand, human rights should not be used as a justification uh, for whatever it may be. Uh, in the eyes of the government, which uh, would be used as an excuse uh, to quote, to destroy the country. So this is taken from 2016 and it, 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 it calls for a certain sense of examination or reflection on what really is the role of human rights in our Philippine society today. And fast forward a bit to the 2018 State of the Nation Address, wherein I believe this was very popularly um, uh, quoted in the past few years, wherein, he, wherein our president said, your concern is human rights, my concern is human lives. And you see now that uh, there is this disjunct or uh, separation, if you may, between the notion of human rights and the notion of human lives. So on one hand, you have this uh, an, a concession or an admission that human rights and human dignity, there, there is a relationship. But on the other hand, you don't know what that relationship is. And in this, in this particular State of the Nation address, it seems as if uh, human rights and human lives are mutually exclusive from uh, each other. So in today's topic, we will just be addressing uh, the question, so what really is the relationship between human rights and human dignity? Uh, it is something that is there to very abstract concepts, but it is these are abstract concepts that are being forwarded, they're being upheld, they're being clamored for almost on a very regular basis, almost every day at least by many, many uh, human rights groups, movements, and activist organizations. Uh, not just that, not just these um, civil society actors, but also on the part of institutions to protect and uphold the notion of human rights. So to answer this question, we will just be briefly structuring our, our, our discussion today uh, see, into three sections. So the concept of human rights and human dignity will look, we'll do a very, very um, comprehensible, very undigestible conceptual analysis of the two and a very brief historical overview uh, we'd like to see also if um, the critics of the, human, of the human rights movement as the notion being a western concept, a western imposition holds true in this historical overview. Then we go on to the documents on human rights uh, some very salient there are so very many around the world and also within our, our country uh, but we'll cite just the most important ones uh, so international documents, national documents, and last but not the least, what is the situation of human rights uh, all over the world and in our, uh, in our current context in the Philippines? Okay. So first, let's talk about human rights and human dignity. Now, 
these are two very, very difficult concepts to define. I don't think there is, a, I would say, a textbook, dictionary, scientific definition to both of these concepts. However, we'll try to make them as, as, as relatable and as digestible as possible, and even as uh, very commonsensical. Because the, there is no use in talking about these two concepts if they don't relate to us in an everyday uh, conversation, in everyday context. So what are human rights? Now, in, in layman's terms, we can talk about human rights in two ways, in a positive sense or in a negative sense. So there are certain things that should be done to others, should be done to us. That's the positive sense. And there are things that should never be done to us or to others. That's a negative sense. And in those two ways of looking at human, uh, in those two ways of viewing human rights, you have this very simple, um, commonsensical, a very layman, ordinary way of understanding what, what the concept of human rights is all about. So there's certain things that should be done to others, but there are also certain things that should never be done to others. You can also look at human rights, whether as in terms of entitlements or responsibilities. So if you talk about entitlement, so kapag entitled ka to something, you're entitled to a certain thing. I'm entitled to proper wages. I'm entitled to freedom of expression, and so on and so forth. So these are uh, things I'm entitled to be done unto me. But there are also certain things that I'm entitled to, to have in which people should refrain from uh, doing unto me. So I'm entitled from... I'm entitled to freedom from, for example, um, uh, unnecessary surveillance or warrantless arrest. So I'm entitled to those kinds of uh, situations or just those kinds of things. And in that sense, you can talk about human rights in terms of what you are entitled uh, uh, as entitlements. But we also view human rights, not as just mere entitlements, as possessing something. It's also a responsibility. It's a duty. It's an obligation. So... With the notion of human rights, for example, certain social actors should be responsible for others. There are certain responsibilities that should be done unto others. And there are certain responsibilities that should never be done unto others. In the same way that the state upholds that there are certain obligations that it has to uphold in order for others, for example, to flourish in terms of education or livelihood uh, or creative output, or, or freedom of um, assembly, and all of these things. So the state has a responsibility to uphold these human rights, as we term them. Uh, in the same way, we, there is also a responsibility, not just for the state, but also other social actors, even, even ordinary citizens, that we should never, for example, um, take away one's life unless in self-defense, or uh, seize property that is not yours. Uh, there's been a long history in human rights uh, uh, on those topics uh, from ranging from the Eastern and Western traditions. We'll talk about that later. But the main point here is that you can also view human rights as not just possessing something as a, as a mere entitlement, but it's also an obligation uh, to do to others or to not do unto others. And in all of these ways, very commonsensical notions of looking at human rights, it, it, it's a bit circular, it's, it's a bit redundant, and it's not that informative. Uh, that's why they say that human, defining human rights is a, very, it's a very, very difficult task. But really, the basis of it is just by virtue of being a human person. So just by being you, you are entitled to certain things, and you also have corresponding responsibilities to um, adhere to in society. So in those senses, without being too theoretical, without being too philosophical about the notion, this is how we can ordinarily view and define human rights. Now, other, others would classify human rights. This is a very, very convenient tool of classifying human rights uh, in terms of what they call first, second, or third generation human rights. The first is really the most popular in, in a lot of liberal societies. Uh, the political and civil human rights, second generation is social economic human rights, and the last one is uh, cultural, uh, third generation human rights. Now, I, I in decided to include physical integrity rights because a lot of these rights are actually very, very um, 
I would say, very applicable to our context now, although they can technically be sub assumed or talked about already in political and civil rights. So we'll just go very briefly on what we mean by these kinds of rights. So apart from the previous uh, commonsensical definition of human rights, we can also classify human rights into these uh, three broad categories. Political and civil rights would mostly entail uh, the right to life, freedom from torture, slavery, or arbitrary arrest, uh, freedom for, of opinion and expression. So these are some ways in which you can view uh, some, some manifestations of political and civil rights. Uh, we'll talk about these more later on when we go to the International Bill of Rights. Social and economic and cultural uh, rights. Uh, for the social and economic second generation rights, these include the right to work and other labor rights such as um, safe working conditions, occupational safety and health guidelines, right to adequate standard of living or shelter, uh, and income, right to adequate food, and right to enjoyment of highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. So this includes uh, the right to education. So those are under social and economic rights. Cultural rights, the most popular of which is really the right self-determination for peoples. This has norm historically included uh, nation states, but now this has uh, trickled down to the right to self-determination for smaller communities like indigenous peoples and tribes. Okay? And physical integrity rights, uh, again, these can be technically subsumed in uh, political and civil rights, though, it's very, though there has still been a lot of discussion on how very important these rights are now in this day and age when we talk about the right to be free from political violence and error. Uh, these include torture, arbitrary imprisonment, and extrajudicial killings. And so you can see why this is very applicable in our modern society in, in, in the Philippines. And we'll talk about how the national situation of, of these kinds of human rights are affected uh, in today's age. Okay. So these can so those are the three classifications of human rights: first, second, and third generation human rights, along with physical integrity rights. Okay. Now, human dignity. If human rights is difficult to define, human dignity is all the more um, more challenging uh, to encapsulate in words. And a lot of people would actually find it useless. Uh, to try to define it. Other people would say it's redundant. You actually don't need a concept of human dignity if you already have human rights. So it's, it's actually a very hotly debated topic now, at least in political theory and, and political uh, philosophy. But nonetheless, although it is difficult to define, it has, we can, we'll, we'll talk about the, the very, very many usages and the very many um, salient features and why it's important to include the notion of human dignity when talking about human rights. But in a nutshell, human dignity is uh, an all-inclusive concept and it is just basically the recognition of all humankind. It's encompassing of all humankind and all of its diversity. So regardless of race, gender, class, uh, sexual orientation, social status, and so on, human dignity is, is is in this sense uh, encapsulated by this recognition of humanity. And that's why, although again, it sounds very circular, like the human rights definition, it's not really um, telling anything more, but with concepts like these, um, the reason why we can't say anything more is that for the most part, they're givens and their assumptions, uh, their foundations of how we can live with one another. So that's why, in, in some sense, a lot of these definitions fail to be more elaborate. But if they are the given, the fundamentals, they don't require as much uh, definition, more elaborate definition, as just by virtue of being human in both these two senses, human rights and human dignity. Okay? Um, but although we can't, it's very, again, we can't say so much more about the topic on human dignity. They, it, the, the concept has its benefits, it has its advantages in society. So when you want to uphold human dignity, it's like a protest against humiliation uh, or discrimination. 
So not to be discriminated by your sex, gender, class, and, and all the other social contingencies that we mentioned previously. That's why the concept of human dignity is very, very vital in, 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 in forming a well-ordered society. It's also protest against extreme deprivation or, or agony. So to, to live a life that is um, in constant surveillance or to live a life that does not challenge you cognitively through education or to live a life uh, wherein you don't have enough um, income or wages to sustain your family, that is not a dignified life. And so it is to, to live a dignified life would go against, again, extreme deprivation and agony because it says something about how one human being should live life. Uh, so there, human dignity is important in that sense. But uh, but apart from this, it's also an appreciation, this concept for human excellence within individuals and cultures. So what this basically means is that to live a dignified life is not just to be free from all of these external constraints that hinder you to be who you want to be, but it is also a manifestation. It is also a way of, in a way, um, letting you be free to do certain things that you want in life. And so it's an appreciation of the capabilities and the development and the potential development of a human person. So to live a dignified life is also a life of, of, of excellence, of making your life worthwhile. So it's an appreciation in that sense. And, and in the fourth sense, is also probably one of the most important aspects of human dignity in relation also to human rights, is that unlike human rights, wherein many people especially if I'm not mistaken, in, in, the, in the current administration would criticize the human rights movement as being just a Western imposition. The notion of human dignity is something that is culturally ingrained in so many diverse societies. So there are many cultural specifications, many different ways in which a lot of societies have have viewed, have defined, and have materialized their concepts of human dignity. So they have some notion of human dignity, whether you come from the quote unquote East or West. And these have been applied um, by the peoples themselves, so the popular applications. So that's why the notion of human dignity is very, very attractive, also, especially if you establish it on a movement, uh, on a political movement, a social movement, ethical movement, especially that of uh, human rights. And then the importance also of human dignity is that there is an overwhelming consideration on the part of everyone, really, to extend this uh, notion of dignity to everyone. So what a dignified life for one should it be a dignified life for all. And that should also provide enough motivation for action. So it's not just a mere conceptual analysis that we're doing here. It is also, when we talk about human dignity, you shouldn't just theoretically know more about the concept, it is a call for you to act on how to extend this notion of human dignity to, to every other person. It is also a, a base for legal compass. What this basically means is that in, the, in a lot of the declarations, in a lot of documents about human rights, it always starts with, in the preamble or in the first articles, with a mention of human dignity. So the notion of human dignity has, has been historically institutionalized. It has been mentioned time and time again in a lot of important documents, especially in human rights. It gives a lot of good justifications, a good rhetoric for justifying, for giving good reasons for why we should uphold human rights in the first place. Because it talks about uh, precisely this, the integrity of the human species by virtue of being human. And not just that it's a legal a compass, it's a legal guide uh, for how to conduct oneself with others in society, it is also a ma it's also a moral. There's a moral dimension, not just a legal dimension. The moral expectation of people to abide by certain standards of human dignity, a threshold, a minimum standards, a standard for what we would consider as a dignified life. So it's really a, an all-encompassing. Uh, concept that talks about the law, that talks about morality and ethics, and that's why human dignity is something that we shouldn't forego altogether. And now what is really the, the, the relationship between human rights and human dignity? What do they do for one another? Or are they mutually dis, dis, disjunctive? Are they mutually exclusive concepts, as uh, some of our political leaders would suggest? No? So both of them arise simply just by being human. So 
being a human person already entitles you to have human rights, entitles you to live a life of dignity. But what is all what, what also these two concepts can do with one another, as I mentioned before, this is just a fancy term, this overlapping consensus. Because again, I've mentioned that there has been a lot of backlash and criticism when it comes to um, where the human rights movement and concept came from, is it Western imposition? But the thing about human dignity is that if human rights is, is hinged on some notion of human dignity, well, human dignity is something you can find across so many civilizations and cultures, past, present, and future all over the world. And so therefore, it gives the human rights movement a good justification for why we should protect and secure human rights in the first place. So what an overlapping consensus is basically it being cross-cultural, it being as universal as possible, so that we have we come in, in, in a global scale, we come into agreement with what uh, should be the agenda for human rights. Uh, so it is basically a, a contract, if you like, a contract. It's overlapping. It's, 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 it's a similar points of agreement when it comes to the human rights movement. This notion of human dignity. It's a normative relationship. This is just basically means that, as we've said previously, um, these are normative concepts. These are not descriptive concepts. These are not just a matter of definition. These are matters that we should act upon. That's what it means to be normative. They're prescriptions of what you should do. So given uh, these definitions of human rights, given these definitions of human dignity, how can I uphold human, what should I do to uphold human rights? What should I do to secure a level of human dignity? So there. So that's what it means to me. Norm, uh, what, what, what this relationship is, is essentially normative, and they are mutually co-constitutive. This is, goes with the next point that rights can be based on human dignity, so that's one. Human dignity can, can serve as a foundation of human rights, but at the same time, you, you might ask the question, okay, so what is, how can I attain or realize human dignity? One way is really to uphold and secure uh, certain, uh, as, as many political, civil, social, economic, cultural rights as possible. So that's one way of realizing a life that is worth living, a dignified life, is through the securing of human rights. So they go both ways. They, they, they're not mutually exclusive, actually. They work hand in hand to uh, constitute one another, to cooperate with one another, conceptually and on a normative or in a practical scale. Um, they both talk about the basic needs and values of living individuals as vulnerable creatures. So there are certain needs that, that must be met. Uh, human rights, various human rights would attest to that. And to live a dignified life, there are certain, certainly many basic needs that you have to acquire on a certain levels for you to say that it is a life worth living. Uh, both of them protect violation of integrity of the embodied human individual especially when it comes to physical integrity. And they both talk about freedoms. They both espouse freedoms as liberty from interference in a negative sense, exercise of human capabilities to live an excellent, worthwhile, self-actualized life, freedom from dependence, freedom from surveillance, and existential freedom is basically to make your life more meaningful in the way that you want it to. So those are the reasons why we would like to uh, link together human rights and human dignity. Now, I'm just going to give you a very, very brief run through, it's not that uh, comprehensive, of where we can find these notions throughout history uh, uh, and throughout uh, many cultures. So, a lot of people would um, actually not agree with the thesis that. Uh, human rights is a Western concept because, or even human dignity is not a Western concept because we find some traces of it in many Eastern uh, traditions of thought. Like, for example, Hinduism, uh, when you talk about ahimsa or doing no harm to others, this was actually one of the concepts with, which they say credited really to the success of um, the protests and the movement led by Mahatma Gandhi uh, in the anti colonial struggle in India. So, doing no harm to others, that um, no violence kind of protest, the revolution. In Judaism, even in Christianity, we talk about also the sacredness of life. So the sacredness of life and the right to life, it is not actually that mutually exclusive from human rights and human dignity. Uh, actually, the right to life is in fact a kind of political and civil right. Uh, Buddhism, in the Buddhist culture, the respect for life and to extend compassion to all of humanity. 
uh, it's also been mentioned in Buddhism. In Confucianism, they have a specific Chinese word. It's a universal relationship which we should conduct with one another uh, called Sen or humanity or benevolence. So uh, uh, we're, humanity in itself is already being translated by this, or it, it translates to this as equivalent Chinese word uh, in, in Confucianism. Even in Islam, when we talk about equality of all races and the obligation to be charitable to one another, uh, as um, uh, under the will of Allah. So even in these Eastern traditions, we find some notion of human dignity. So it's not that Western uh, after all in, in, some, in one way of looking at it. Uh, even before these traditions, you, you go to the Hammurabi Code, um, eye for eye, tooth for the tooth, but the context of this kind of quote-unquote retributive justice is that it was meant to protect the oppressed under the law. Uh, in the Greeks, in the Greek ancient times, Plato talks about universal justice and how these concepts are not relative. They are not. Um, they 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 are not dependent on the culture on the context. They're actually it's actually universal. So normative concepts such as good and justice, these are all universal. Um, and Aristotle actually says something about. Uh, human dignity. There have been a lot of um, talks about human dignity, how to define the concept, how do you actualize, how do you implement the concept, and they will always start, they would always cite Aristotle because he talks about a life of virtue or a life of arete in Greek, it means an excellence of the soul. So, what does a dignified life is? Again, to be as excellent, to be the best possible version of yourself that you can be. And that is supposedly something that is enshrined in the concept of human dignity and also by extension, the concept of human rights. Stoicism, uh, this is, in a nutshell, really, this is the first explicit um, reference to people being citizens of the world because we are all, we all have universally humankind has reason. So by virtue of reason, uh, which all human beings have, we are all bound by uh, the universe. We are all citizens of the universe. Even in a Christian context, when you talk about natural rights, um, rights sometimes can be considered as something that can never be taken away from you. So a natural law perspective in the Christian tradition would just basically mean that since human laws are, are emanated from natural laws, they're emanated from divine laws. Another way of putting it is that we are all created in the image and likeness of God, and so all of us are equally important. And that is also a very, very good religious interpretation of uh, human dignity from the Christian tradition. Uh, we can also talk about religious freedom. So in the Protestant Revolution, I'm uh, sorry, a Reformation, uh, in, con in contrast to... Uh, established religion at the time, Martin Luther already had this uh, political civil freedom to express one's religion, uh, religious uh, interpretations of, 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 of certain texts. John Locke would say, the state should not impose what my religion is. I should be free to choose religion. And in the many revolutions, especially in, in America uh, and in France, where they have their Declaration of Independence or their, universe, or their Declaration of the Rights of Man, they also espoused uh, historically these delisted de political and civil liberties. And it, it also includes freedom of assembly and organization and whatnot. This is also important, the freedom to criticize, because uh, John Stuart Mill would say, Freedom to criticize is important because that's how society progresses, where good, bad ideas are replaced by good ones and good ones are replaced by bad ones. And that's the only way societies progress. The right to life is also very much enshrined. That is the duty and the obligation of the state to protect the right to life as, as, as much to its full capacity. That's what Thomas Hobbes said in his contract theory. And it's very, very important for Kant in this, in, in this modern context where he viewed uh, it as a moral duty, an obligation uh, to uphold dignity because humanity should not be treated as a means, but as ends in themselves. So it's a very powerful thing to declare, you know, that, that the notion of human dignity is not just a political duty, it is a moral, it's an ethical duty. John Locke would also talk about the right to private property and how since we uh, work on the things on the land and on the things that 
that, that, that we do, we have a right to them, to own them. Uh, so most of these really were civil and political liberties of the first generation. Um, but just to end with the modern contextualization of the brief historical overview, the reason why social and economic uh, second generation rights were put to the f forefront was really because, because of the Industrial Revolution. And the many thinkers and socialist theorists, including Karl Marx, would talk about uh, the labor rights, the white rights of the workers, and how they should be free from religion. With certain, because in a nutshell, really, because religion alienates who from who you really want to be, uh, because of your working conditions. In a nutshell, and from private property, because it all the more alienates workers, the bourgeoisie, uh, uh, the, the 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 profiting class, and the working class of the proletariat. So it it basically there is a social segmentation that happens. And that is something that the civil and political rights movements were unable to address. And that's why there was this, there has now been a lot of, uh, until now and then, a good amount of attention to social and economic rights. And I don't want to go into this in detail, although this will basically serve as a context for the documents that we will be talking about when it comes to wars. And civil and, and civil rebellions, really. Uh, so before the Declaration of the Univer Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a lot of turmoil in the world was was experienced by everyone at the time. Uh, and the, the the you may ask, since we talked about a political, civil, first generation, and second generation social and economic, so where did the notion of cultural uh, rights come into play? Uh, I mentioned earlier that this usually the right to self determination was usually upheld or was usually um, forwarded by nation states. So, and that 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 was to the detriment for a lot of people, especially with uh, colonized um, nation states. So, after the world wars, where you 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 see people, you see nations holding their right to self-determination to the point of fascism, really. Uh, but really, and, and mass genocide, of course, that led to the Declaration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Uh, the Russian Revolution was a self-determination movement in some sense because it was the first working class uh, revolution. Um, and the Cold Wars and the continuing anti-colonial struggles. Uh, the point really here is that because of all of these wars that were happening, especially on a global scale, maraming na iitik na ibang nations, especially colon uh, formerly colonized nations. And that's why the right to self-determination for nation states uh, was extended, really, uh, not just to the powerful, quote-unquote, superpower countries at, at, uh, during the time, but to say that we no longer want to be part of uh, the col colonialization imperialism uh, movements at the time. Uh, so there, so that's why cultural rights were very, um, uh, just to contextualize where cultural rights came from. And now, since we're on the topic of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, so it's now probably time to talk about what are the legal basis for human rights. And of course, the international document the most important one of them is the International Bill of Rights, where in, here is in Shrine 3, the UDHR of 1948, uh, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights of 1966, and on the same year, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So all the generations of human rights are enshrined in this bill. So I'm not going to talk about all of these because these are very, very long. And you might as well give it a good, give it a read. It's actually uh, nice to be informed. Very, very, very important to be informed of your rights and strength in this bill. And I just want to highlight the clauses where they talk about human dignity. Because one of the important aspects and the reasons why human rights and human, the relationship between human rights and human dignity is so important is that the notion of human dignity helps justify the concept of human rights, even on a late legal basis. No? So in the preamble of UDHR, I'll just go through this very briefly. You already mentioned the very first statement is recognition of inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. Uh, and later on, uh, you talk about the fundamental faith in human rights, 
the dignity and worth of the human person, equal rights of men and women, and so on and so forth, for to promote social progress, better standards of life, and larger freedom. Uh, in Article One, and probably the most cited on human uh, on human dignity, that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They're endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood. That's Article 1. Article 22, to give emphasis not just to political and civil rights, but also to economic, social, cultural rights. They are indispensable, again, for dignity and the free development of, this, of a person's uh, personality. Okay? And in Article 23, uh, talking about work, again, on social and economic rights, uh, everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring for himself and his family existence worthy of human dignity and, and supplemented, if necessary, by other means of social protection. So these are the explicit uh, mentions of uh, human dignity, even more so when you go to the international covenants of the two uh, first and second generation rights. In both of their preambles, again, you also there is also recognition of inher inherent uh, human dignity, and recognizing that these rights derive from the inherent dignity of the human person. In the ICCPR, uh, in Article Ten, this was talking about the criminal just criminal justice. So even if you have done wrong to society, if you are labeled as a criminal, these persons deprived of their di liberty shall be treated with humanity and with respect for the inherent dignity of the human person. So sure, you should never forget, despite them being a criminal, that they also have inherent uh, dignity. You know? Whether you, uh, uh, you created a heinous crime or you just use drugs once in a while. Uh, uh, in Article 13 uh, of, of the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Covenant, um, again, this is on education, actually. So we agree that education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality in the sense of its dignity and shall strengthen their respect for human rights and fundamental freedom. So to live a worthwhile, excellent life, there is always the right to education to help you with that kind of meaningful life. Okay, so those are for the main document, uh, main international documents that are worth um, noting. Uh, for our purposes, we meant this is actually very elaborate. The, the concept of rights and dignity is very elaborate in our constitution, especially when there is an article uh, dedicated to it, uh, Article 3, uh, the Bill of Rights. So we'll just go through again um, the men, how, how these documents mention human rights and uh, in relationship to human dignity. In Article 2, this is a declaration of the principles and state policy. So the, the principles of our Constitution in Section 11 says that the state values the dignity of every human person and guarantees full respect for human rights. So it, is not, it cannot be clear as this, that our Constitution upholds the dignity and human rights of every person. In Article X1, I, 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 uh, Section 1, the Congress shall give highest priority to the enactment of measures that protect and enhance the right of all the people to human dignity in the aims of reducing social, economic, political inequalities and remove cultural inequities. So you see all of the generation of human rights are encapsulated by this uh, Section 1 article from political, economic to cultural rights. Okay? Um, and a lot of men, I will not go through all of them, those were the most salient, but we also talked, uh, the Constitution, uh, Constitution also talked about the rights of the properties of workers, indigenous cultural communities, farmers, small settlers, fishermen, small property owners. So it's a very, very elaborate and explicit um, mention of, of, of rights in these contexts. Free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship, the, the right to remain silent, to have competent, and in independent counsel, preferably of his own choice, especially uh, in inquiries conducted by the legislative, um, the right to form people's organizations, uh, an establishment on a commission on human rights, the role of education in its appreciation for human rights and citizenship and, and, and the intellectual property of scientists, artists, inventors, and here very important, the role of the military in respecting human rights. Um, now, 
the context of this, as with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was a turmoil in, in the world, the world wars, the, the context of this obviously was um, the aftermath of the martial law period, wherein Amnesty International, again, um, uh, recorded around 70,000 who were imprisoned, 30,000 who were um, tortured, and around 3,000, 3, if I'm not mistaken, or 4,000 uh, who died because, uh, in Mar due to the human rights violations in martial law. So that's why the, yeah, the notion of human rights is very, very emphasized in, uh, in our uh, law of the land. And here, just to go a uh, brief run through, because uh, this deserves a, a lecture or a discussion by itself, the third article of the Bill of Rights. So just so that you are informed of what your rights are according to this article, so due pro process of the law. Um, uh, there, uh, you are entitled to that. You are not. You have a right against warrantless arrest. You have privacy of communication and correspondence, freedom of speech, expression, and press. The right to people to peaceably assemble and petition, free exercise and enjoyment of religion, as mentioned previously, liberty of abode or shelter, the right of the people to information. Formation of unions, associations, societies, you have a right to that. Uh, if, uh, if your private property was acquired by the public state, you should be justly compensated for it. There are provisions about the impairing of the obligation of contracts. Everyone should have free access to the courts and quasi-judicial bodies and adequate legal assistance. You should be right, you, should, you have the right to be informed of uh, the right to remain silent and have competent and independent counsel, as mentioned previously, you should not be tortured, you should not be applied force on, violence, threat, you should not be intimidated, there should be compensation to and rehabilitation of victims of torture, you have a right to bail, you should be presumed innocent until the contrary, uh, mentions about the writ of habeas corpus, should not be suspended unless in emergency situations of invasion or rebellion. You have the right to a speedy disposition of your case. No person shall be compelled to be a witness against him or herself. No person shall be detained, this one, uh, solely by reason of political beliefs and aspirations. So for holding a political belief, you should not be arrested for that. Excessive fines shall not be imposed, nor uh, should be cruel, it should not be degrading. Punishment should not be inhuman. Uh, physical, psychological, or degrading punishment against any prisoner should not should be prohibited. Uh, and there's also a mention of the use of some standard or inadequate penal facilities under subhuman conditions. If you've watched the documentary of Aswang, where they, you see a little, um, you see ordinary citizens who were being bribed uh, by uh, police, uh, um, allegedly, uh, to pay instead of being incarcerated for being suspects of uh, drug use um, because they cannot afford to pay. They were, if I'm not mistaken, they were sent to be incarcerated in a very, very tiny um, room. No? So that, that is an example of substandard or inadequate penal facilities. It's a, it's a subhuman condition. And therefore, um, you might say, well, definitely uh, taking it from the Bill of Rights is pretty much unconstitutional. It goes against the spirit of what the Bill of Rights is saying. Now, for the last part, so we talked about uh, the relationship between human rights, the history, the concepts, uh, the important legal documents that we need to know on an international level and national level. So what's the situation of human rights around the globe and in our present context? Now, in the international situation, um, the human rights movement is pretty, very much alive. Um, but in a sense that there are new challenges to the human rights movement, and especially human rights activists, because for so long, throughout the history of the human, of the human rights movement, although its aims were to include as many people as possible, actually there were, there were many instances, not just many instances, it is fraught in history, wherein there were a lot of, of groups that were also marginalized and excluded instead of included. So women, children, 
the LGBTQIA, the rights of the disabled. Since if you noticed in all the documents uh, that we mentioned before, uh, the pronoun, even the simple pronoun of his rights, of hum of mankind, not of womankind or not even of humanity in some in some other older documents. No? So it gives you this impression that although in theory, one 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 good way to assess the human rights movement, although it wants to include as many people as possible, it was not too many due to many factors. It has ended up excluding so many people. So although we talked about labor rights and the social and economic uh, rights covenant, no, uh, until now we still struggle with um, good paying wages. Uh, with uh, contractualization, uh, depending on the context uh, of your country, so um, uh, regular irregular employment, uh, and so on and so forth. So again, subhuman working conditions, occupational safety and health uh, workplaces, whether they are really safe for, for work. Uh, so even until now, labor rights is still an issue all over the world. Uh, Women's and children's rights, of course, um, since uh, very, very recently only in the turn of the last century, where at least in the West, women were allowed to vote. Uh, children, LGBTQIA, and the rights of the disabled, since the, the, the assumption of humanity, as with the Stoic tradition, is that we are all reasonable. But the thing is, children are not in the they would they would argue were not uh, included in that normal range of of, of reasoning. No? Uh, LGBTQIA it was not the norm. It was not normal. It was not uh, quote unquote normal at the time no? uh, to be other than just um, cisgender or heterosexual. And if you are disabled cognitively, for example, how can you be within that normal range of reason? And so, therefore, that 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 definition of humanity and human rights did not include these groups, but actually excluded them. So until now, even on an international level, we see very varying situations per country when we talk about uh, the rights of these marginal right, marginalized groups. There also there's also the situation about the impact on the environment. Although we will not go into that, since uh, rights the rights we're talking about does not extend to animals or to the environment, but just humans in this in this case. But the 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 effects of global warming and climate change will have their effects on our labor rights, on our 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 right. Um, for physical health, to cultivate physical health and mental health. So all of these things really um, about environment, we should address it also in, 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 in conjunction with human rights. Uh, the issue of migration, since um, you have many uh, migrants from uh, war-torn states, uh, or from, from states wherein they're no longer satisfied in their governments. So when they enter a new government, uh, they can be, or, or a, a new nation state, uh, quote unquote, illegally. You know, they're not really technically citizens, since the law does not apply to them. Um, they can be treated um, in some ways very heinously. You know, in, in Humania, they can, when they get a job, they can also be paid uh, below what, what should be adequate or they should be they can be exposed to hazardous working condition, conditions. So global migration is also uh, an international uh, dilemma when it comes to human rights because what who covers whose whose rights um, when it comes to their rights, who covers their rights since they are migrants? You know? uh, cultural rights, um, again, this this uh, the right to self-determination initially at was mostly applied to nation states, but what about smaller communities uh, like uh, indig indigenous tribes and communities? So when, um, for example, a multinational company uh, in encroaches on the ancestral domains of an, inter of an indigenous uh, community or indigenous people, no? um, whose rights will you uphold more and do the rights of these uh, cultural groups uh, prevail at the end of the day. And national security issues when it comes to terrorism now, since um, global terrorism is something that is very, very porous. It, it permeates to very many, uh, many, many nation states around the world. So national security is definitely an issue. Uh, and just to, to, to segue, I guess, and that's probably the reason why uh, many lawmakers would vouch for uh, 
the success of, of the Anti-Terrorism Act, which we'll get to in a while, when we talk about our own national situation. So um, just to give you a just to give you some some uh, responses to the international situation of human rights in our context, there have been to be fair, many legislations that would address these. So, for example, on labor rights, the labor code for for women's rights and children's rights, the Anti-Violence Act against uh, women and their children of 2004, there's a Magna Carta for women, even for disabled persons. When it comes to the, the environment, uh, toxic substances, hazardous and nuclear waste control act of 1990, uh, you have the Philippine Clean Air Act, the Philippine Clean Water Act, the Ecological Solid Waste Act Management, a Management Act. Uh, so there have been environmental policies about it. And when it comes to cultural rights of indigenous uh, peoples, there's an indige the IPRA, the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act of 1997. To say that really, um, uh, in all fairness, at least when it comes to lawmaking, there have been actual legislations to address these situations of human rights. But that's not to say that our situation is perfect. So, so for example, the right to life. Uh, what is our situation now? So you're very familiar with the drug war. Uh, without due regard for the rule of law, says in UN rights, Chief, this was taken actually very early this year, this news from Rappler, June 2020. Uh, the killings have been widespread and systematic, and they are ongoing, even in uh, light of the pandemic, to the point that last year, the UN rights council adopts a resolution against uh, the Philippine drug war killing, so it has garnered international attention to that extent. Uh, according to Human Rights Watch, uh, the PNP listed around only 5,000 deaths due to the drug war uh, operations. However, this does not account for the vigilante-style killing by unidentified men, in which 20 at most it can it can almost amount to 27,000, according to our domestic human rights groups, so 27,000 deaths. So even the right to life, when you talk about human rights and human, your concern is human rights minus human lives, uh, but again, the right to life here as a human right itself is, is very much under threat now. Freedom of the press, so very uh, recently the ABS-CBN shut down uh, the Maria Re Res a threat born of uh, contempt for the press, according to an international human rights lawyer, and it's intended to have a chilling effect on independent voices among civil society. So here, what is the national situation of our uh, freedom of press? Well, here it is. Uh, the Human Rights Watch also uh, said that the administration has shown a relentless uh, assertion, relentlessness in its per persecution of government critics. Uh, unseen in a very long time, the charges against Rappler and its people should be dropped according to the Human Rights Watch in, in relation to press freedom. Uh, again, uh, arrests have been made under the new COVID-19 special powers legislation which criminalizes alleged spread of false information. This is, this is uh, in relation to suppressing freedom of expression and tightening censorship during this crisis. Even when it comes to political and physical integrity, rest is very important in our day, uh, in our context, especially when there have been deaths of human rights activists and defenders. Uh, so this is Zara, Zara Alvarez, uh, a Karapatan, Karapatan rights worker um, who was recently killed or died. Uh, and, and supposedly they, they hopefully would make an investigation uh, about this death. Uh, so there's a new level, and this administration ushers a new level of danger for activists and defenders. So the number of activists and human rights defenders killed is increasing since 2016, and, it, and with the advent of the passing of the anti-terror law, uh, it brings new dangers. Uh, in, this was actually, as of just last year, March 2019, so obviously the figures, well not obviously, probably the figures would be raised uh, as it's been a year. Uh, so in this current administration, there have been 2,370 uh, human rights defenders charged by the government. That's more in the three years than all of the terms, uh, respectively, separately, uh, by the way, of the previous administrations by Aquino and Arroyo. Uh, so as of now, the numbers are still rising. When it comes to children's rights, um, when you, the, the, the drug war, this was in the first month of... of uh, the, the term of uh, pres President uh, Duterte, no? uh, you see that there's already been a profiling uh, all over the country by the PNP of uh, 
child drug ab- drug users, majority of them are users. These are 20,584 children. Okay? This is data from the PNP. And 98% of them are merely drug users. No? Uh, not a certain very small percentage of them are pushers or even four years old. It's very alarming, uh, the war on drugs uh, when it comes to children. And of course, we're very aware of what happened to Kian de, Kio de Los Santos, 17 year old, uh, too young to die really. Uh, and a lot of, until now, a lot of claims for the ju- justice for uh, Kian still remain. No? Uh, so part, this is, is also very alarming on the part of children's rights activists. Um, LGBTQIA uh, rights, although we won't get into the legalities of this very, very recent issue about Pemberton being granted absolute pardon, this is symbolic for the LGBTQIA uh, rights movement um, because this has something about what is done to, the, to a fellow transgender um, individual. So what does this say really about how the government handles very, very sensitive issues, especially when uh, as part of a historically uh, marginalized groups such as uh, trans, LGBTQIA plus uh, individuals. Okay? Uh, especially the SOGI bill on sexual orientation, gender identity, and uh, expression. Uh, last year, uh, the, the state said that we have to respect LGBTQIA plus rights, but actually it was not deemed any more um, uh, urgent. Uh, by the Malacan Yang. No? So when it comes to anti-discrimination laws against our LGBTQIA plus um, uh, fellow citizens, I, uh, malabo. Uh, it has not been passed until now. It's not being considered or urgent as of now. Even cultural rights, so um, because of the martial law in Marawi, what has been done uh, to the bakwit or evacuees, uh, right to shelter, adequate uh, abode, no? Moral leaders dispute reports and rights because we have no home for the past few years. It's a big violation for human rights. Uh, not just this, no, even uh, in Mindanao, you will see that cultural rights are its a hot topic in, in, in Mindanao. And I hope that we give more attention to it than it's, that it's being portrayed. You know? uh, when you talk about the militarization of schools, how this affects, again, children's rights and the right to education itself. Uh, and of course, cultural rights as they are part of um, an indigenous uh, peoples. No? So that is the situation of cultural rights in our country. This is probably the last issue that we'll talk about before we end uh, this discussion on national security. So national security, although there's a topic and a different module about national security, we can talk about it in terms of our uh, what our territory and our so- sovereignty as a, a nation. No? So although there have been many who, uh, like uh, Justice Antonio Carpio, who would say uh, Philippines has exclusive right to exploit all of its resources because we have the sovereign right that belongs to us, um, recently, very just this, uh, this year, Sona in 2020, um, there is no there is no pressure really to claim sovereignty uh, because we are not prepared to go to war. So it is best to cool off, uh, says the administration. So these are out of the many uh, human rights situations around the globe and in our local context. And I hope we realize that now more than ever. Uh, we see the importance of not just human rights, but also human rights in conjunction with human, human dignity, and that they are not actually mutually cons- exclusive. They mutually constitute, co-constitute one another. So before we end, and uh, uh, hopefully that you got the message that now more than ever, we have to uphold uh, human rights and human dignity uh, to the best of our capacity, capacities and abilities. I will just end with this. Um, this is the 11th, it's a quote from the 11th president of the University of the Philippines. And Carlos P. Remulo actually was a representative who helped draft, a uh, representative of the Philippines, uh, helped draft the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he did a lot of considerable contributions to that article on inherent dignity, the very first article. Uh, he spoke vehemently and passionately uh, against uh, anti-colonialism and the, the right to self-determination of states and the nations. So he, he was very, very vocal about that in, in a lot of proceedings. 
uh, about the UDHR. Uh, he, he, he spoke against uh, subhuman working conditions, hazard in human, condition, uh, human working conditions, and also discrimination against women. And just to end with this quote, Nations will rise and fall, but equality remains the ideal. The universal aim is to achieve respect for the entire human race, not for the dominant few. Okay? And so with that, uh, I hope you see the relationship between human rights and human dignity. Uh, so it is now our time to uphold human rights. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ang ng boses ang sigaw ng masa Ang bagong pag-asa ay Mula siyo, mula siyo, mula siyo Panibagong pag-asa ay mula siyo